uh, went through, we talked about the basics in terms of um, what is reinforcement learning and how do we define it as a Markov decision process. So I'm just gonna, this is the same deck, I'm just gonna go through very quickly. And we got to the Bellman equation. So um, for reinforcement learning, we formally define it as a Markov decision process. And the key thing here is that every state is um, memoryless. So all of the um, activity from that state forward doesn't depend anything on the history. And so this isn't really a limitation of what you can express as a Markov decision process. It just means that, uh, I think the example I used last week is if you're playing Pac-Man and you have the exact same board position in terms of where Pac-Man is, where all the pellets are, um, <clears throat> the difference between zero lives and having three lives or, or whatever, having one life and having three lives, um, that information has to be part of the state because obviously it's the difference between when you die, you get another life or you die and the game's over. Um, so, um, so it doesn't really limit what you can represent. It just means that everything that you need to know has to be part of the state. So um, I like to, uh, I, I'm, I can, for, for complex things, I often find it easier to um, see them visually. And so I kind of like um, thinking of Markov decision processes as a graph. So here's an example of, of only two states, high battery, low battery, that's in the book. Um, and then the different paths, you see that the small dark circles are the actions. And then the different edges, sometimes there's only one edge, sometimes there's more than one because uh, it, it's probabilistic. You don't know which, uh, which way it's gonna go. You can, you can get a different reward amount and you can, get, um, you can wind up in a different state. <clears throat> so the key thing with modeling it as a Markov decision process is that every time you take an action, you get just one little piece of feedback. You get the reward for that one action. But what we really wanna know isn't what am I gonna get in the short term? What we wanna know is how well am I gonna do in the long run? And so that's the difference between reward and return. So return is the amount of reward that you're going to get, um, um, not just this step, but this step and every step after that. And uh, we typically talk about discounting, but the, the discount factor gamma can be one, in which case there's, there's no discount. Um, so you can really model dis either discounted or not discounted with, um, by including gamma in there. So then, um, this takes us to the concept of policies and value functions. So policy is just what your strategy is. So um, you can have something that's a, a pure strategy where 100% of the time you do a particular action. You can also have a mixed strategy where a certain percentage of the time you're gonna do different things uh, from the given state. And so when we go from the concept of reward to return, the value function is saying from this state, what is the the best possible return I can get. So again, it's not the immediate reward from the next action, but it's the cumulative sum of all the rewards from then on when I'm following a particular policy, a particular strategy. And we can represent the value either for a single state by saying what's the best thing, or I find it in some ways it's a little bit, um, for me at least, it's a little bit more intuitive to say, what is the value of a particular state and action combination? So if in this given state S, I do action A, and thereafter I follow policy pi, um, what is the long-term return I'm gonna get on that? And so the, the, the value function for a single state, we represent with the letter V, the value function for state action combo, we, re we represent with the letter Q. So this takes us to the Bellman equation, which basically says the value function for a state. So this is, what you're going to get under a particular pot, the best, you, you know, the, the expected value, the average uh, return you're going to get from a given state if you have this strategy, this, this, this policy pi. Basically, all it's saying is it's going to be a sum of all the average returns from the different branches that you could take from there. And so we show that basically this formula says, here's the probability for each of the actions. That's the immediate branches out of a state 
here's the probability of where you wind up when you take those actions. And then this is our standard formula for the immediate reward plus the discounted return from a future state. And so then we showed, you can do this as a diagram. And so the sum of um, pi, the probability that you take each of these different actions, that's just represented by the three different actions in this diagram in green. And you're just gonna add those up. So whatever the, whatever the, the return is from the left branch, you're gonna add that to the return from the middle branch. You're gonna add that to the return from the right branch. And so if you do each of those, let's say evenly one third, then you can take one third, one third times the return from the left plus one third from the middle plus one third from the right. You sum that up, that's the return for the policy pi from all these actions. Well, what is the return from each of those individual actions? Well, that's just gonna be the return from all the different states that you could possibly wind up in. That's represented by the orange box. Um, and the return again is just your immediate reward plus the discounted uh, future return from whatever state you wind up in. Then we showed an example with, with uh, specific numbers. And so if you knew, this was, somebody asked a question, this was good because I didn't explain this. If you knew the discounted returns, where's my mouse? Um, if you knew the discounted returns for each of these states, and by the way, these, these states don't have to be unique. This could be state one and this could be state one again. And in fact, this state could even be the state that we're already in. You could wind up back in the current state. But the, the bottom line is, if you kind of knew what the total return over time would be for these um, states, then given all the different branches, if you, if you know the probabilities um, from your policy and you know the probabilities of the environment, then you can just sort of, you know, just do the math. You can, you can multiply it out and you can calculate based on these red numbers at the bottom, I can calculate that the, the long-term return for um, state S in this case is nine. If you look here, right, the immediate rewards, one, two, four, zero, six, three, they have nothing to do with this value nine. You have to know what is the, the future return of all these next states that you could be in. And so then just to recap in terms of the math, if you're trying to read the book, um, anytime you see pi times something, that just basically means add up all those somethings for the different actions that you might take from your current state. And anytime you see this formula P, which is the probability that you wind up in this new state, S prime, all that means is just add up all the Xs from the different branches that you could wind up in after taking that action. It's possible that for a given action, there's only one place you wind up in. There's only one branch in that. Well, that's easy. It's, it's just one number. But in the, in the event that it is random and that you could wind up in different places, then, um, then that's fine. You're just gonna, you're just gonna um, sum it up. And so since these probabilities always add up to one, whether you think of it as a weighted average or where you think of it as a weighted sum, it's sort of the same thing because these, um, either the P's or the Pi's, they always add up to one because they're probabilities. Um, and so if you, if you kind of think of it that way, then any, when you see a lot of these formulas later on in the book, they're really not so scary because you can just basically sort of ignore this whole sigma pi, blah, 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 and just say, oh, add up the branches for actions. And you see this whole thing with sigma and p and whatnot, and you say, oh, just add up the values for all the different states you wind up in next. All right, so that's my like super quick <laughs> recap of everything we talked about last week. Any um, any comments, questions, anything um, uh, up to this point? Could you could you go back to, to evaluate? Back? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I heard Hobbs and Ryan at the same time. Hobbs, do you want to ask a question? Sure. I was just wondering, do you have to add up all of the branches? all the way to the end of the all, do a breadth first search of an exhaustive search in order to calculate that value? So you could do an exhaustive search. In this case, what I'm saying is that I'm not actually going more than one step ahead because I'm saying, I'm not saying how, I'm saying magically, I know what the, the value function is for these new states, okay? So I'm just, recursively saying that the, the 
the value function for state S is going to be like along this left branch. I don't know if you can see my screen hubs, but you know, one third probability of, of go, taking the left action, three quarters probability of winding up in this state and the discounted future return for this state is seven. I'm not explaining to you how I knew it was seven. I'm just saying if I knew it was seven or if I estimated it was seven, then I'm just going to basically say it's one third times three quarters times seven or eight, one plus seven from this branch. Um, is is what I'm summing up into the total return for my state S. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So you, you have some other technique for, for estimating the branches. At the, basically, you know what the end state is of the game, and you work your way back with some estimates to all the branches, and then you work your way back to the one you're at. And so then you can, I guess, uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to do the recursion, is what you're saying. You're just doing it. You're just doing one recursive step. Yes, exactly. So in a really small game, small problem, you actually don't have to do this thing that I'm doing. You can just do what you're saying. You can just write out the full tree from top to bottom, and then you can just add everything up. Okay. But, but what we're going to be talking about is utilizing this recursive formulation where you say, my, so if I didn't know what these numbers at the bottom were, seven, four, eight, six, okay, I could still say that S equals one third times three quarters times one plus unknown, and one third times one quarter times two plus unknown, and four plus unknown, and zero plus unknown. And so basically, I would, I would be able to express the value of S in terms of these six unknowns, unknown one through unknown six. Okay, um, and I, I could, uh, without going too far, I mean, basically, that would be useful to simply say, and so hypothetically, you know, as you start to get a sense for what these unknowns are, then you get a sense for what S is, even if you aren't 100% sure about any of those particular values. Got it, thank you. I would like to offer a simple example just Please. you know to keep in uh, in your head when you think about it uh, i read about a consultant who was uh, helping um, different uh, non-commercial entities to get grants and she was talking with one of such entities and learned that the approach was to go for uh, the greatest grants so she uh, recommends them different things. She recommends them to compute a probability with which they can get a grant. And it is simple because the, no the number of, uh, you know, th the amount of money is known. So they can compute how many uh, participants could get a grant. And the number of participants is known too. So as a result, they took all the grants and multiply them by probabilities with which they can get them. And it's turned out that the biggest grant would bring the least math expectation. And they went for grants which are not so big and they quite, but, yeah, they benefit a lot from such approach. But, but there was less competition for these, these smaller grants is that is yes that what you're saying yeah they cool. got uh, at the end they got more money that's an awesome example of how uh, that's like an algorithm to live by that's a, that's a way to do business and do your personal life make decisions like a mark on the chain well in personal life you know cal calculating the return is difficult <laughs> Once again, the, the reinforcement learning will be about estimating things. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll see a way to try and come up with some estimates. I don't know. Ryan, um, was that similar or did you have something else you wanted to ask? I, I had a similar question. I just kind of wanted to run through the whole thing, just understanding all of the symbols. So if, if I'm understanding this correctly, you start at the initial state that's at the top. Yes, the white circle is your current state. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the pi, that's your policy. And that's saying that you have one third of going the left branch, one sixth, middle, one half, right branch. 
in terms of which action you choose? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, obviously, in some real world problems, you just always take the middle branch. So mm -hmm. this would be 100% and be zero on the others. But but if you don't, if you have non-zero values on more than one branch, that that is okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then, given you take one third, then there's a three quarter chance you go left and a one quarter chance you go right. Because even though you made that decision, there might be some some randomness within the environment, right? That's what that's. Yeah. Right. So like like if you're playing Space Invaders, maybe there's a there's a one quarter chance that like some flying saucer appears at the top of the screen, but a three quarters chance that it not that mm -hmm. nothing hap nothing yeah. new happens. Yeah. Right. Something like that. But. Mm -hmm. And so what what is the P in between the branches, the two thirds and the one third? That's just the, the probabilities? Uh, yes. So so P is the function, the orangey yellow function that tells you the environment's odds of going left or going right. OK. You have no control of that. You get to pick the green. You get to pick a third of the time I'm going to go left, a half the time I'm going to go right. And then the environment is going to randomly do what it does. Sometimes you get a, a spaceship, sometimes you don't, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then okay. R is the reward for actually going down whatever branch. That's the, the higher red number that's mm -hmm. sort of still near the edge. Yeah. So that's your immediate reward. But, but then you wind up in a new state and you have mm -hmm. some number of moves after that. Yeah. And so that's that's what the S prime, the bottom you node, know, that's saying basically, here's the value of being in this state because we'll go down the rest of the path and then you'll end up getting this many points or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yes. So in a simple example, um, I, 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 I don't know if I can come up with like a, uh, a, a realistic example, but imagine that you're playing something that's not too complex. It doesn't have that many moves, you know, maybe like 10 moves total or something. Right. You can imagine if you worked backwards, if these were all the end game states, like I win, I win, I win, I lose, I win, I lose, then you would know the values for all these. You know, it'd be like one and negative one or whatever, right? You'd know the value for all these. And so if 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 you got to a certain place in the game where all the, the next actions were either you win or you lose, then you can immediately calculate what the value of this strategy pi is uh, from that point because because these are all very definite things mm -hmm. and once you did that for all of the things that immediately preceded the end games well then you could go to the move before that and so you could you could figure out the value for all the moves two before the end and then you could also figure out the value for three before the end and you could you could you could work your way up mm -hmm. That's that's the general gist of this. Okay, but the key thing, which we're we're about to get to, this is what the next slide, uh, the next main slide talks about, is um, we're using a recursive formulation, which says that if we know the value of of these various states that are our successor states, then we can calculate the value. Whoops did not need to do that. We can calculate the value of our current state. All right. Um, what we're going to get into next is something along the lines of if we can estimate, if we don't know, no, but if we can estimate the value of our successor states, then we can estimate the value of our current state. And if you can estimate the value of any of the states, then you can estimate the value of all the states. And that's, that's ultimately where um where where the the next session is, is kind of going so to speak cool anybody else any other questions all right so so where we're going now is that was just expressing if you had any old policy pi in that case it was i think one third left one sixth middle one half to the right. Well, we aren't necessarily interested in calculating the value for all random policies, all random strategies you could have. What we really want to know is what's a good strategy, 
right? That's generally speaking the goal of reinforcement learning. I want a good strategy that maximizes my return. So, um, so if our if our strategies, our policies are are, are um, notated with the letter pi, what we can do is we can create a partial ordering. Okay, uh, we can say for some policies. We can say this policy pi is strictly greater than or equal to this other policy pi prime. If for every single state, the value of, of under policy pi is greater than or equal to the value under this other policy pi prime. All right. Now it is not true that every single policy can be compared in this way. Not every policy, it's not always true that with two policies, policy one and policy two, that either one is greater than or equal to two or two is greater than or equal to one. Sometimes there is no ordering because sometimes one does a little better in some places and two does better in others. But for any uh, given policy, there will be some policies that you can say are greater than or equal to that one. All right, does that make sense? Are you guys with me? This is a partial ordering. All right, so now, uh, um, I'm not going to kind of go through the proof, but basically it goes along the lines of you can show that for every policy, there are some policies that are greater than or equal to it. Okay. Um, and because this is a finite MDP, okay, a finite market decision process. You can prove that basically if you keep following this chain of policies that are greater than or equal, greater than or equal to, eventually you're going to run out. Um, and so when that happens, basically that will be your optimal policy. So um, if you have a policy where, uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go into any further, but so basically, um, simplistically, you can kind of think about it in terms of like, uh, if two policies differ only in the action that they take in one state, well, then whichever one has the higher return, then that's the one that you, that's going to be the better one. And you can just keep doing this until basically you have the maximum action for every single state. So we use the, the star um, to indicate that something is optimal. And so the notation in this book is uh, pi star, it's a, it's a subscript star. I, I've seen in some papers they use a superscript instead of a subscript, but basically um, if you see star, then that means it's the optimal policy. So for finite MDPs, it can be proved that there's always an optimal policy pi star. And just note that when we say optimal policy, we, we, we use, when you write it in a sentence, you, you write it singular. There may actually be multiple policies that all give you the same return, okay? Um, so there can be more than one, uh, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, they're all equivalent. They all will have the same value V. And so um, we just we just always use singular when, if you read the book, you'll see that it always uses singular. It talks about pi star, but it doesn't, it's okay if there's actually more than one that are equivalent. And um, and basically this, this thing at the bottom just says like, you can compare what I was trying to say before. You can compare policies to find the optimal policy. And so basically the optimal value V star is just, just going to be whichever policy pi has the biggest value, the biggest number. And the optimal action from a given state S, the optimal Q star is just going to be whatever action A gives you the maximum return. Now remember, the return is from now until the end. I, I normally talk in terms of episodes. You can do continuous um, once also, but for simplicity, it's easier to talk about in episodes. So the 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 value is is the total sum of the rewards from from now until the end of the episode. And so um, if you somehow magically knew, you know what um, the Q value was for all all these possible things, then you just take you just take the maximum. You just take the biggest one. So you can, you basically, you can just follow a greedy strategy. All right, so I felt like this one, this slide was a little bit hand wavy, but um, let me just check in with you guys. Are you, are you with me? 
yeah, is I think making I sense. Can, uh, the optimal policy is for any given state, right? It's 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 determined for every state. The uh, yes, the optimal policy tells you what to do in every state. It is. Um, it's not just the optimal policy for state one, it's the optimal policy across all states. Given you are at a certain state or given you could be at any state? Given you could be at any state. So we can define like what's the best action to take from a certain state. That would be Q start for state, a given state, state number 17 or whatever. But when we talk about the optimal policy is what, what should your strategy be overall across all states from the beginning of the game till the end of the game? So, so to go in on that a little further, if the states, all states S were 100% observable to mm -hmm. the agents, then in theory, one could have a unique set of actions that one is doing for every state, but that that collection of if state state one, I do the, if state two, I do, you know, B, if state three, I do C, if state, you know, that, that is your policy, right? It, and, and if your, if your states have some portion that is unobservable, then your, your policy is still, pi is still state dependent on the part that is observable. Is that right? Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes. So like hypothetically, if you had a big enough computer, you could just you could just enumerate all the different states, all the different possibilities for chess. And then at some point, you would just be able to simply say mathematically, you know, pawn to king four is the best move. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to do it 100% of the time. Now, depending on what my opponent does, I may have to have different responses. But basically, if I'm white, I just know this is the highest value by, it may only be higher by 0.001, but it's higher than all the others. So I'm just always gonna do that, right? And for each situation, you're just gonna say, I'm always gonna do this, I'm not gonna do that. I haven't really talked about um, um, partially observable games. Uh, it, it, to my knowledge, I, I, by no means am I the, 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 the expert on this yet. You know, to my knowledge, basically um, how partially observable games are solved is by um, reformulating the way they're played in a way that they become fully observable and then they just work like this, okay? Um, there, there is a, a, a field of partially observable Markov decision processes. So instead of MDPs, you're doing POMDPs. And I don't really know the math around those, but, but it gets hairy enough that apparently people don't try to actually solve those. They just reformulate the game as a fully observable one. So like, for example, poker, you never see your opponent's cards, but you can reformulate it in, in a form where um, it, it, it becomes a fully observable game and the strategy is identical to the true poker game that's partially observable. Uh, that makes sense. Actually, now I'm thinking back to your previous slide with the numbers and you could almost think of that as being fully observable with the, the numbers below being just you know, some random response that occurs after you've chosen your action, not some. Yeah, some yeah so, so like in Texas Hold'em, your opponent has, you know, roughly, you know, two cards, 50 different cards, you know, roughly 2,500 different, you know, hands he could hold, right? Um, right, and, and we're, so we're you, sitting here thinking of, of our opponent as holding the, uh, you know, quantum superposition of all of those or something. <laughs> Yeah, but basically what you can do is you can just use Bayes' rule and you can just sort of say, based on, on his actions, here's the conditional probability that he has each of those, you know, thousand different hands. Um, and, then, and then you can just treat it as fully observable based on those, those thousand probabilities. By the way, <clears throat> the consultant I mentioned earlier, she was a poker player for many years for like, uh, you know, at least 15 before she got to be a consultant. And what she did, she, she actually used Bayesian rules. And she said that during her career of about 20 years in poker, she uh, earned 
several million dollars just by Bayesian rules. And people who observed her would tell her, but you do not win all the time. And she would reply, so what if I don't win each time? The result with which I go home is still good. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I would find it way too stressful to like be paying poker for a living. Me too. So he, but even if I could do the math, I just don't think I could hack it. Uh, but she wrote a book, and for me, it's pretty much enough about, you know, word of poker. I do not want to immerse in it. Yeah. Uh, word of caution, there is this other phenomenon that uh, in addition to being a really good poker player, you do need a bankroll. <laughs> so if you don't win every time, uh, you, you do need a big enough bankroll that you don't ever go broke. All right. So so now that we've talked she about- She said that they have a mm -hmm. whole group of people and they help each out once in a yeah. while. You, you, you need, but you, I'm just saying you need some form of bankroll so that if you have a losing streak that you, you, you aren't. Broken. Yes, there are some <laughs> rules for losing streak too, by the way. Okay, so, so what, we, what we said in the previous slide is that, um, that, let me just go back. So um, that there is in a finite MDP, there is always an optimal policy and um, it's true that under the optimal policy that basically the value in any, the value for each state is just the, max, the maximum value for um, all possible policies. So this is where it being a Markov process is really, um, is really important, okay? So if I said, all told, there's a thousand different strategies that we could play this game. And the returns are, you know, one, two, one, three, three. and one of those strategies has a return of 10 and it's more than any of the others. Um, what, this, what this line says is that in the optimal policy um, from that state, we're always going to play such that we pick up this, this 10, this return of 10. Well, you might say as sort of devil's advocate, but what if 10 is a bad idea because XYZ happened before this or XYZ is gonna happen after this, okay? But that's where the whole formulation as a Markov decision process is key because in a Markov decision process, it does not matter how you got there. You can never say, but what if XYZ happened beforehand? In a Markov decision process, it never matters what happened beforehand. It's memoryless. The, the value in a given state is only dependent upon that state and all the information contained in that state. So that's why you can just say, we're doing this very greedy thing where we just pick um, whatever the maximum value is amongst all the different policies for state one. And we pick the maximum amongst all the different policies for state two. And if we composite all of those, that is in fact the actual value function for the optimal policy pi star. And the same thing in terms of individual actions. Okay, so this phenomenon of saying that it's stateless, so therefore I can just sort of know that we pick the maximum. This is sort of the key um, equilibrium that we will have whenever we found optimality. So, so we saw before the Bellman equation for value, the, we now have two Bellman optimality equations and we can write them recursively. So the first one is, let me walk this, through, let me walk through this. The first one is the, the optimality equation for the value of a state. So I copied this out of the book. I haven't been talking about sort of these expected value formulations, but let me just, let me just sort of talk through without going through all, all of the equations, okay? So the value of the optimal policy at a given state S. So this is, now we're just talking about one particular S. This is, this is not all S's, this is just um, a particular state. Is just going to be um, the maximum uh, return from all the different A's that we could, we could do in our current 
um, state, all the different actions that we could take. So if you look at this backup diagram on the right here, here, let me, where is my, how do I make my, uh, my mouse a little bigger. Okay, so we're in this given state S and in this diagram, we have three different actions we can take. There's gonna be a total return from here. Actually, there's gonna be a total return from here. There's gonna be a total return from the middle and there's gonna be a total return from the right. We're just gonna greedily choose whichever of those three is biggest. And if that's, if that's, um, if this is one, this is two, this is 10, we're gonna take the 10. And so then the, the value under the optimal policy for state S is always gonna be this biggest one. It's gonna be this 10. Okay, now what we can then do is we can also say this, this total return here, how can we write that? Well, we can write that as the sum of the probabilities for these different branches. So now we're talking about these branches down here, okay? Not the ones, not the actions, but just the different um, consequence branches. So um, this is the thing I said before, whenever you see the sum of P times something, that's just adding up all the different branches. And it's the immediate reward from that branch plus the discounted reward from whatever future successor states S prime that we wind up in down there. Okay, and so the goal of this, um, what I've been talking about is we want to write V recursively as a function of itself. And so that that's what we've done down here at the bottom is we've said V star is a function of V star of other potential successor states. So you guys with me, does this make sense? You guys want me to go through this another time or? Ted, you have a with you in chat and you had a thumbs up in. Uh, oh, okay. Time. Awesome. It's, it's, thank you. It's hard when I'm uh, sharing my screen. All right. Uh, let me clear this. Okay. So, so again, um, what, we're, what we're saying is that when we have achieved optimality, then we know that um, the value for the given state S is just picking the best branch um, based on the future states. One, you know, what we're talking about, like, you know, one step ahead. We can do the same thing for actions. A little bit harder, um, uh, for me, it's a little bit harder to, to say it, but basically if I um, am in a state and, and uh, I take a particular action, that's the, the dark circles, then there's the function P that says, you know, you might randomly wind up in this state, you might randomly wind up in that state. And then from there, you're gonna follow your policy and you're gonna take the next actions after that. And so what we can do is we can write Q star as a function of recursively as a function of itself. And so basically it says Q star is once again, this is just adding up the returns from all the different branches. And what is the return? The return is R plus the discounted re, um, return from picking the best possible actions from then on. So again, assuming that we have an optimal policy, so we've got the best policy, then we know that the value for a given action is just going to be um, the summing up all the different branches from that action, and then from then on, following our optimal policy. So again, this is sort of an equilibrium that says this will be true after we found the optimal function. 
Okay, we haven't said how we're going to find it, but we're just simply saying that this will be true once we have found it. All right, so, so these optimality equations are what we're going to use to develop our learning algorithms. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. This is really kind of like winding down the, the intro portion because we're not gonna get into the meat of different algorithms uh, today. But um, does anybody have any questions on the two optimality equations? Uh, not a question on the equations, but more mm -hmm. on the underlying assumptions. Yes. Um, are we assuming that the value of being in a state uh, S is not dynamically changing over time? And, and by that, I mean like some kind of opponent that can change his or her strategy in reaction to our choices. Um, is that like an, an assumption that we're making when we're formulating it this way? So, yes, I think, I think um, when we formulate it this way, we're assuming a stationary environment. Okay. And that would include in this case, your, your, your opponent's strategy. So um, either your opponent's strategy is fixed or if you're playing Pac-Man, you know, the environment um, doesn't change. So, you know, the particular ghosts, they act the way they act. They don't just change on the fly on level three because you're doing well. Got it. Okay. I'm sure you there's some way- include, that... You can include such ch changes in a state. So it yeah. is not a previous state. Right, you, right. You I was saying you could reformulate state. the problem if it's if it's going to be more complex, but but we're but we're assuming that whatever, just like Maya said, whatever can vary, we've incorporated that into the state. So if for some reason you're you're, you're playing a game and the, the 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 probability of a spaceship is 0.2, but then later in the game it changes to 0.1, we just include the probability of a spaceship as part of your state. Exactly. I just just a side thought. So even typically, I think of these in terms of like just a, a fixed game, where regardless. So like a simple one is um, what's it called? Tic tac toe. Regardless mm -hmm. of your opponent's strategy, there's a certain optimal solution, um, and and you are essentially prepared for whatever they can possibly do. And we've seen even in super complex ones, like in OpenAI, um, like they've done Dota, which is a complex video game that's partially observable. And, and you have all kinds of opponents that can do all kinds of random stuff. You, you essentially, your, your policy eventually is finding something that is optimal for all of those different things that can happen and it doesn't necessarily change on the fly because your opponent is doing something different. It, it's just essentially meant to be baked all into the policy, I think, typically. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that gets into kind of a slightly different branch, but basically, um, if you knew your opponent's way of playing, if you, if you knew your opponent's strategy, okay, and so you, you had, they had sort of a fixed policy of how they were playing. Then you could use what we're talking about here to find the optimal strategy for your play that would maximize your return against that particular opponent's strategy. And then you could say, here's four different hypothetical strategies they could play, and you could individually maximize against each of the four of those but the problem is when you maximize against strategy one, that might actually do poorly against strategy two. And when you maximize against strategy two, that might do poorly against strategy four, okay, from your opponent. Um, so so in, in these two player or multiplayer type games, um, ultimately what people do is they look for a Nash equilibrium. And so uh, not gonna get into, you know, all of, all of that, but, but um, you can prove that in, in these sort of multiplayer finite zero sum games, there's always a Nash equilibrium. And in the Nash equilibrium, um, there is no, 
there is no advantage to differing from your strategy, okay? And so what that does, basically along lines of what you're saying is you cannot take advantage of um, someone who's following the Nash equilibrium strategy, all right? So the Nash equilibrium strategy works really well against all possible opponent strategies. It is not, however, identical to saying that you found the best strategy against each potential opponent strategy. Because like I said, there may be a better strategy against opponent strategy one. The problem is that that better strategy has weaknesses against other ones. And so it is exploitable. The Nash equilibrium is not exploitable, okay? But it's not, not the best. So, so for example, um, let's say you're, you're playing poker. I don't know if people know poker, but if you're playing against someone who's like super conservative, okay, you can bluff the hell out of them, all right? So you're constantly raising and they just keep folding even though they have medium good cards. And the only time that they're gonna challenge you is when they're holding, you know, ridiculously strong hands. And so anytime that they raise or they, you know, um, you know, start putting chips in, basically, you know, unless I, you've got a massive hand, you're just going to fold at that point. But until then, you just keep, you just keep raising and they keep folding, even though they have hands that maybe in the long run, they would have won. That is the optimum strategy against someone who's super duper conservative. But in poker, people know that that strategy is exploitable. And so if you think that they're super conservative and you keep raising, but what they've been doing is they've been playing you, they've been baiting you, then all of a sudden, you know, they turn around and potentially they can exploit you by having you put in a whole lot of money and then suddenly not being super conservative and playing somehow differently. Okay. Um, and so that's, that, that's basically kind of what happens in these in these uh, two player type games is, is people go for the, the Nash equilibrium because it's not exploitable, but it doesn't mean that it is maximum against any one given opponent. It just means it's not exploitable. I don't know if that sort of helps in terms of explanation. All right, so this slide basically says uh, kind of what we talked about before, which is that if you have a really small problem, okay, and you know all the dynamics, you know this P function, you know the exact probability that if you do an action, where you're gonna wind up. In some small games, right, it's just 100%. You do this, you, and you wind up there. Um, then what you can do is you can basically um, solve out your whole tree because basically the value for a given state state number one is at most a function of all the successor states, which is at most the, the other, you know, n minus one other states. And that's true for each of the other states. So you're, you're gonna have uh, n value functions, one for each state, and they're gonna be at most in um, n unknowns. And so this is like, kind of like, you know, n linear equations and n unknowns. And so you can just, you know, crunch through all of this. So you can do a brute force um, exhaustive search and you can find the optimum value V. And once you know the optimum value V, you can actually determine the optimum policy because it's just the greedy one. It's the one where you, where you look one step ahead and you, and you choose the action that gets you to the maximum value. So then why don't we just do this? Why don't we just do this for chess? Why don't we do this for, for Pac-Man, for Atari games? Um, so, so to do this brute force, you need three things. You need the dynamics of the environment to be perfectly known, okay? It, it, that's true in chess, okay? There, there's no uncertainty. When you say move, move my bishop over here, that's exactly where it winds up. There's no randomness. There are no spaceships that randomly fly onto the chessboard. Um, the game needs to be fully have the Markov property. Um, and then here's the real kicker that comes in the most is you have to have enough memory and compute in order to actually be doing this thing. So um, in the book, it says that that backgammon has approximately 10 to the 20th states. So if you had the memory in the compute, you could actually do a linear problem of 10 to the 20th unknowns, 10 to the 20th equations, and 
I don't know what is the what is the time to solve n linear equations. It's n squared or n cubed or something like that or whatever. So hypothetically, you could just massively crunch and you could have a, a, a complete solution for backgammon. Although even once you computed this solution, it still would take you 10 to the 20th uh, you know, bytes to, to write down what you're supposed to do um, for, for all those different states. So for all those reasons, for the lack of having one or more of those three properties, what we have to resort to is we have to approximate. So we may not know for the last decimal place the exact optimal policy. And everything, like I say here, everything but the, the smallest, most trivial problems, we're going to have to approximate. So the other, um, the other sessions where we talk about reinforcement learning, it's going to be studying ways to approximate value functions to find close to optimal policies without having to do the brute force thing because it's just too hard, too slow, too complex. In some cases, um, we don't even know the dynamics of the environment perfectly. And then there are extensions to this. We talked one, about one, which is uh, where, where you have, un, where you don't have full information. So if you have partially observable game, um, and there's other you know, kinds of tweaks for, for infinite, for whatever, uh, but they all follow this, this basic gist. And you can even have where the environment's changing. So I don't know if formally the book's gonna get there, but I think generally speaking, people just talk about it in terms of a stationary environment. And then there's some tweaks that you just apply um, on top of it, just so that you keep learning over time so that if your environment starts changing, then you, you, you start updating. All right, any questions? So um, the last thing here is just to talk about how do we do incremental updates? So let's talk about a very uh, simple thing that we wanna do, which is just um, calculate the mean of something, okay? So, um, Last week, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what's the average return for a slot machine after you've pulled it n times. Um, I think I gave an example about you're going to go running in the park and you want to know what is the average wait time for a water fountain. So what you can do is you can write down all n observations, right? Uh, so you sum them up and you divide by n. That, that's how we calculate the arithmetic mean, right? Um, but doing it that way requires... Um, a large amount of memory so that the longer we train, the more memory we need because we're recording all of these different n observations. So instead of doing it that way, there is a way you can incrementally calculate the mean. And so this is an online version of this instead of a batch version of it, okay? So in this, you only need two memory um, slots. You record n, your, your current number, and you record the current running average. So in this case, I'm gonna call that you know, Q sub n. So at any time step n, our new average is going to be the old average plus one over n times the difference, all right? And if you work, if you work out the math, then, then you can see that, that, that this actually um, is the case, that um, when you have one number and you get the second number, then you basically add one half of the difference between the first number and the second number. And when you already have a mean of two numbers, then you're gonna add one third of the difference between the current mean and the new one. And as you get more and more, as you get a larger n, the amount that the new number affects the mean gets smaller and smaller because of this one over n. Okay, so that will cap, this formula here will calculate you an exact arithmetic mean over n numbers, but it's an online algorithm in the sense that you're only using two memory slots. You're not keeping track of every single observation that you've seen over time. We have a general incremental update form, which is this sucker here, okay? So it says our new number Q n plus one is the old number plus some small number instead of one over n, now we're just representing it generically as alpha, times the difference, the difference between our current number and our, and our average. 
And so specifically this formulation Q, okay, is looking at the value say of a particular uh, action. We use the letter Q for that. And so then we can update the value when we actually try something by saying, we're gonna use some small learning rate alpha times the difference between the reward that we got and the actual, uh, um, the, sorry, the, the previous estimate of Q. And so this is just a, a form of iteratively adding a small step um, to our current estimate. Kind of looks to me a lot like, you know, the gradient descent algorithm, right? We have an alpha learning rate and we say, hey, the, the, the gradient tells us, you know, this much, uh, we're not going to take a big step, we're just going to take a small step alpha. So from our old position, we're just going to add a small alpha times whatever um, that, that function is, is telling us. And so basically what you're going to see then is that the rest of these, these um, reinforcement learning algorithms are using that to incrementally improve your state value function or your state action value function, your V or your Q. But it's not easy, unfortunately. So part of it depends on how you design the rewards. Part of it depends on the particular algorithm you use for updating. So what feedback are you getting? Are you using one reward? Are you doing a whole, playing out the whole game and finding out who wins or loses and then doing an update? And ultimately you want the model to converge quickly because if you have a particular algorithm and it turns out that it will solve chess for you, but it'll take 80 billion lifetimes of the universe before it converges, that doesn't do you any good. You need something that's gonna converge relatively quickly. And we wanna do all of this while dealing with memory and compute limitations. Um, and so um, that's why up until pretty much this past year, people had not solved um, no limit um, heads up Texas Hold'em. Um, it's because they had already figured out algorithms that worked for this other stuff so that they could solve simpler versions of poker. But in no limit, there's um, the, the, the bet, if you don't know poker, the, the, the bets are unlimited in size just based on how many chips you have. And so that increases the possible actions at every step instead of having just a handful of things you can do. Um, you, can, you can discretize it, but still there, there's many more um, actions you can take just because of the different chip amounts that you can raise. And therefore the game just exponentially um, is bigger than any of the other forms of poker. And so uh, until they had a slightly better way of dealing with it, they just, they just ran out of memory and compute. It wasn't that, that theoretically they couldn't solve it. They just didn't just didn't have the horsepower to do it. And so then that's what, that's what, um, so next session, you know, we're gonna talk about uh, dynamic programming and then get into Monte Carlo methods. And that's uh, what kind of incremental updates are you going to do in order to calculate? All right, any comments, questions? Can you please go to previous slide? Absolutely. Um, I'm afraid I wasn't very attentive, but I see that at first you have small r and then you switch to b, uh, to capital R. Is there a, uh, and I don't understand how it happens, sorry. I guess you know, I, I was too sure of myself. No, I mean, it's, it's fine. I, I, I've tried to follow the notation in this book. Okay, I'm not sure if everybody uses it. I'm not sure if I love it. Um, but basically, uh, what what Sutton and Bardo use is when you're talking about a theoretical reward R that happens at a particular point in time, they use lowercase R. Ah, okay. Okay. When they talk about the reward at time step five, they say capital R subscript five. So whenever okay. you see R subscript time step number, N, they use capital R. Ah, okay, it is actually usual convention in uh, statistics. When we have uh, random variables and we have values which this random variable can take. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
All right. And then actually for Q, we've been talking about this Q is the, is the value function for states and actions. Capital Q is our approximate. Uh, so, so lowercase Q is the true value function. Q star is the true optimal and capital Q is our learning, our, our, our estimate of the lowercase Q function. That's, that's the terminology that you see pretty common in, in the papers that I've looked at. <laughs> okay. So to recap here, um, what, we, what we've wanted to do to set things up is explain what reinforcement learning is. Um, you've got an agent in an uncertain environment. We're, we're formalizing it as a Markov decision process. So the state is memoryless. We've got a bunch of notation. I have a recap slide on the next slide, all the different notation. We show the Bellman equation and just basically thinking of it as adding up all the branches. Um, and then, we showed that you can kind of brute force the optimal solution for very small problems, but we have challenges and that's why we're going to use these iterative update algorithms. So that's our recap. And so then this next slide, where's my mouse? Um, so this is the, the cheat sheet. So we use S for states, A for actions. And again, uh, I haven't gone into kind of the details so Sutton and Bartow use this script curly capital S to refer to the list of all possible states and little s as um, you know, the state in, an, in a given equation. But again, when they're talking about the discrete form, uh, you know, state at time step n, then they use capital S lowercase subscript n. And then same thing for, for action and reward. They have a curly A, that's all possible actions, a curly R, that's all possible rewards. Um, we've got our discount rate gamma, transition probability is P. Again, for some games like chess, you don't have to worry about this, it's just 100%, there's just one place you wind up. Um, but for other games, there, there are random things that can, that can happen at various points in the game. Um, V is the value function for states. Q is the value function for states and actions. Uh, P is our policy, uh, a nerd. So I looked up what's the Greek word for policy and it's politiki begins with pi. Um, and then whenever you see a star, that means that's the optimal algorithm. Most of the time we will not achieve the optimal algorithm. We're just going to approximate it and get pretty close. All right, um, so let's see here. We're, we're pretty much at time. Um, let me just mention, so the plan that I had is we'll take next week off for Memorial Day um, and then come back in two weeks. And then chapters four and five of the Sutton and Barto book talk about, uh, again, dynamic programming is chapter four and then Monte Carlo methods is chapter five. And so again, this is not, this is not getting into sort of the more advanced stuff that that if you're reading a paper, um, but this is the fundamentals that all of those other things are based on. And I think at this point, you should have the terminology to be able to to read and understand most of what they're talking about. If you're reading, you know, current papers about poker or poker gets a little bit more complicated just because again, you don't know the other players cards, but if you want to read about like AlphaGo and how they solved Go and that kind of a thing. Um, I think at this point, um, should have most of the tools to be able to read papers like that. All right, anybody um, have thoughts, questions? I, I have one thing that I'd kind of like reviewed. Um, so talking about discounting, I don't know if you could go back to that slide. I'm not sure how far back that is. Kind of the, the core of my question though is, so you talked about setting it to one 
and then I, I assume that the value ranges between zero and one. Yes. And so let's say that you have a value of um, 0.5 or something like that. I assume that mm -hmm. that's, that's reducing the amount that you care about future reward and that's prioritizing current reward or is that other yes. way? So, so, so gamma close to zero means you don't care about the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. A uh, gamma of one means the future is equally important to the present. And actually, when you're playing a, um, a finite game like chess, you can just set gamma to one. It doesn't really matter. The only time you need gamma is if you're doing a continuous problem. Okay, so if you have reinforcement learning that's running an electric power plant and it's trying to optimize, you know, everything, get the maximum power out for the minimum, whatever, you know, fuel con consumed, there is no end to the game. It's just going to go on and on and on and on forever. And if you, if you have an infinite series of rewards, then the return G can be infinite. And so if gamma is anything less than one, even it's point nine 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 nine, then it's then, then the sum of that infinite series will actually be finite. And therefore all the theorems and all this stuff about everything that gets proved in the book, we haven't mostly gone through the proofs, but all those proofs hold because the return is a finite number. And so you need gamma for that. But in practice, if you're just doing poker or whatever, you can just set gamma to one and kind of ignore it if you feel like it. I mean, sometimes you might want a problem where you purposefully say, I'm more worried about my immediate returns than I'm worried about my future. Um, but if it's a finite game, you don't have to do that. You can just leave it as one and then it kind of falls away. Mm -hmm. It's partially to make it terminate. Yeah, it's just to make it terminate, make everything finite. Um, but like, like for example, you know, if you're if you're playing chess, like if you win or lose, if 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 every move is a zero and winning is a plus one and losing is a minus one, okay. Whether you set gamma equal to one and you get a plus one and a minus one, or you set it to you know 0.99 or whatever, and so 50 moves later, it's now only worth let's say half, right? You still only have two signals, right? Either you win the game and you get a positive number, or you lose the game and you get a negative number. And whether it's plus one or plus a half, they're the only the only non-zero signals, and so you're gonna you know wind up with the same strategy regardless of whether you. Um, whether you use gamma equals one or you use gamma equals something a little bit less. You'll find that the, the actual values in your value table are gonna be different depending on gamma, but the strategy won't be any different. You know, Something that, that will result in you winning a chess game will always be the best move regardless of if you discount or you don't discount. Um, you just, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe this can kind of come up in chess, but but in theory, I guess if you discount, then there's a slight incentive to win sooner, to not prolong it. So. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. You no, know, in finance they have a similar formula for mm -hmm. amount of money which was invested in some uh, uh, wealth in bank yep. and uh, gamma is the interest rate expressed as decimal yeah and they even have a very interesting language for this they have the, they said that we have current value and we have future value in one two three years and we have past values when yep. the money which we have now actually were less than now. Yeah, absolutely. And and every CFO that I've worked with, if you can get $100 tomorrow, that's better than $100 a year from now. You know, um, maybe it's only a few percentage points, but it's always true, right? Well, it depends shows. with which amount you start. It also shows up in an exponential moving average, uh, which is related to momentum for uh, learning rates with uh, like say TensorFlow or something. Yeah, and, and you can, I think you could kind of think of this, this infinite series of returns kind of like a exponential, you know, average, but it's the future, not the past, right? 
Right. It discounts the future uh, or. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it exponential moving average. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually an exercise in the book where they set up this uh, this problem where it's like you can get a small reward with um, with high certainty or you can get a larger reward down the road further away um, with with um, lower probability. And basically in the exercise, they show that like for gamma values that are very small, so close to zero, then you would always choose the, uh, the small value right away because you're highly discounting that thing that happens five moves from now, right? And then in the exercise, they actually ask you to show. So at what point is, is it become a wash? And then for gamma values, you know, larger than, than that particular thing, I think it ended up being 0.5. So if you have a gamma value of 0.9, then actually you're better off. You get you get more rewards if you choose the bigger thing, but you have to wait for it. But it just depends on your discount factor. So if you're uber impatient, <laughs> then you take the smaller thing now. If you if you don't discount too heavily, then you take the big payday, even though it's five time steps away. All right, cool. Well, I think uh, we'll stop here and it's uh, 1.30, so we'll transition to the um, project discussion. But thanks guys for hanging with me. Uh, feel free if anybody wants to just send me any feedback. Um, again, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, um, take the concepts that are in the book leave out as much of the math as possible, but still we have to have a little bit of math just to you know, understand things. And then um, I think for people, it'll get more concrete um, in two weeks, next session, because basically there is, there's gonna be some theory, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna open up a Jupyter notebook and, and we're gonna take a very to a toy problem, but, um, but we're actually going to train an agent. And so if you have any questions, <laughs> about like what exactly is doing it there. Yeah, like we can actually show this is what the number was before. Now we're gonna take a step. It's gonna run an update and now we can show you the new table and and you know it'll be very clear because we'll we'll be able to literally see how it, the number's like 0 0.1 higher after after we ran an update. So so for those of you who are sort of less loving the the math, the theoretical part, even though the book stays very theoretical, I'm gonna try and just have um, notebooks so that uh, we can we can make everything concrete. So just like the Bellman thing, I, I put some numbers, you know, on a graph just to show an example. So we'll do we'll do real agents to have examples if there are questions about any of the algorithms. <laughs>